Welcome everybody uh, to Designing Effective Virtual Flyers. My name is Jenny Leonibut. Um, I'm the Exhibits and Outreach Coordinator um, or Outreach Space Coordinator at Man Library. Uh, mostly what I did in the before times is a lot of um, exhibit design. Um, so exhibits, um, uh, the exhibits themselves, the panels, um, promotional materials, so posters, and a lot of other um, graphic design work, um, creating cards and things like that for, for Man Library. Yeah, and my name is Daisy Wiley. I also work at Man Library. Um, I am the, I work in doing outreach and things like graphic design, helping out librarians, um, doing event graphics. So a lot of the things, if you see like flyers or things like that around Man Library, a lot of those are me. So today we're going to take you through a few of the uh, elements that are most important for a well-designed virtual flyer, um, including the text usage, your links, uh, the fonts that you use. Um, and we're also going to talk a bit about images and color contrast. Uh, Daisy's going to go through a little bit of color theory and hierarchy, um, and then a little bit of basics about image types and um, how to export so that your file is correct and usable and at the right resolution for posting, primarily with the, the goal of thinking of posting to LCD screens on the Cornell campus. But of course, LCD screens all over the place are pretty similar. Um, also very briefly, um, we're gonna show that in both uh, GIMP of course, but also in PowerPoint, you can create other sized um, files so that you can produce like a, a flyer that you would print instead of a digital flyer. Um, but busy next. So these were the, the assets for the tutorials that we're gonna do. I'm gonna walk you through PowerPoint, which is um, a simple but actually fairly powerful way to um, create graphics uh, or to utilize your graphics. And Daisy's gonna walk you through GIMP. Um, and these are in the link. Um, and I see there's some issues, someone had some issues getting them to work, but hopefully it should be up and running. So um, if you wanna download those and get uh, yourself prepared for the tutorials, they're gonna come up in a little bit after we go through some of these topics. Yeah, so right now we're just going to go through some basic things with when you're designing digital flyers, things that you have to keep in mind. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about text usage in digital flyers. So you have to consider that when something is made into a digital flyer, it's likely going to be put on a rotation on a screen. So it will be displayed from anywhere from like probably eight to 10 seconds, something like that. So you don't want a lot of text because people aren't going to be able to one, read that in the time that it's displayed and two, you know, they're just not going to want to, it's not really eye catching. They want something like some big title they can see and like really grasp what the idea behind the flyer is quickly. So you don't want too much text on your flyer. Short, catchy title, maybe like a sentence max to describe the event is ideal and things like, if you have a link, include that. Um, date, place of your event, if it's an event. Uh, you don't also, you really don't want to use hard to read fonts like this script font here on this um, badly designed flyer I made on purpose. So don't, don't do that um, because that's just, you can use something like that for a title maybe if it's really big, but for anything longer text sections or smaller text, it's really not legible. Um, here is another example of some things you don't want to do. This is too much text for a flyer. It's, you're not going to be able to absorb all that in the eight to 10 seconds that it will be displayed. Type is too small in some areas. Um, I'd say like, the smallest you want to go with type on any virtual flyer is probably like 12 points maximum. Um, these really are just meant to get the word out about an event or something like that quickly and just get the, the main info you need. It's not like you're not putting like a whole essay on there. Um, this is a good example of text usage on a virtual flyer. So the title is short and clear. Um, there's the date and the location, all the essential info you need to know, and the fonts used or the typefaces used are really just easy to read, nothing, nothing too crazy. 
um, there's good color contrast and everything. And actually that is going to, oh, here's another example too. Um, large type, minimal type, um, good fonts. And, and Jenny is going to talk a little bit about links. Here we return to our example of a terrible slide, <laughs> which is illegible in almost every way, but it also includes this very long link. So uh, in addition to your message, really the most important thing probably you want people to get off of your vir virtual slide is the link for more information or registration or whatever it is that your message is. So make sure that you are never including unnecessary things like HTTPS and www. We all pretty much know <laughs> that those are part of uh, of a web address. If you have um, the dots in there, people are going to get that clue without needing those things. Maybe the next one. So, but even if you're smart enough to remove the www, um, this is a slide that I can make fun of because I made it myself. Um, it's too long of a link. This should really have been shortened into something like, if you can show the next slide, I think. Uh, this one, uh, which was a, a bitly that was made nice and short, like a bitly man hours. That is short enough that people can remember it in those eight seconds that they see the, the slide and uh, you know, type that into their phone or whatever they're gonna do to get more information. Now, Bitly is a paid for service, but tiny URL, which does the same thing is free. So um, definitely recommend using those whenever you can't use something like, Daisy, if you do the next slide, um, like this, if you have a nice short recycle.cornell.edu, use that, that's great. But if you don't have something that concise, then do go ahead and use the tiny URL or the Bitly. Um, to get something that's short enough for people to remember. Next slide. Um, and then <laughs> images and color contrast. So this again is a, a slide I made intentionally to be terrible. <laughs> um, so uh, obviously fairly illegible. Um, the contrast between the text and the background just isn't adequate. In general, it is not a good idea to put text over an image um, unless that image really does work more as uh, just a colored background, um, but you definitely don't wanna put color on color. So if you have this sort of bright orange red background, do not put a bright orange red text on top of it. It is, it is illegible. Um, and while that is fairly obvious, um, there are some color combinations that to some people's vision look perfectly fine. Oh, sorry, stay back. Um, but uh, are very difficult for people with color blindness, for example, to see. So. Um, it's always nice, especially if you have any questions, to go to a place like contrastchecker.com, and there's a lot of other such uh, sites online that you can go to, and it will analyze your color contrast and let you know if there's any problems with it. Um, for example, of red, green uh, color blindness or yellow, um, blue color blindness. Um, yeah, now you can go to the next one. So this one, as our good example, is that while we have a lot of bright colors and it's eye catching, nothing is garish. There's a lot of nice white space there to like let the eye rest. And while we put text on top of the images, there is this um, sort of white bar behind it that gives that great contrast between the text and the background. So it makes it a lot more legible for people of all, all visual abilities. Okay, okay. okay. okay we're good. <laughs> All right, so I'll talk a little bit more about color because this can get a little complex, but um, once you learn some basics, then you're, you'll be okay. <laughs> so you probably have seen this before or some variation of it. It's called a color wheel. And basically it takes your primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue, and then it splits them up, it mixes them. So when you mix red and yellow, you get orange. I'm sure you've heard all this before, but it keeps going out. the more colors you mix together. Um, and these are called tertiary colors, which are the mixed colors. And basically with the color wheel, you can choose one color. In this case, it's vermilion that I'm um, focusing on. And then you can say, I want something that looks good with that. So you can choose something that's complementary, which means it's opposite from that color on the color wheel. So that would be aquamarine. So those two will work well together. Um, analogous is another uh, form of um, colors that work well together on the color wheel. So it's the colors next to one another. So that would be magenta, vermilion, and amber. 
or you could choose a triadic formation, which is any colors that align on a triangle on the color wheel. So that'll be vermilion, violet, and chartreuse. So that's a one good way to choose if you have at least one color you know you want to use and you want to find others that look good with it. Um, this is one thing that can help you. And when you have your color choices picked out, it's called a color palette. And that's just the colors you're working with. And that could just be like, it could be black and white. Yeah, it could be like uh, red and white, or it could be a whole bunch of things. But if you aren't feeling confident about color choices, if maybe colors aren't easy for you, you can actually make a color palette online. You can go to something yeah. like My Color Space and you input one color there and it will choose a bunch of stuff that looks good with it. Um, Colors.com is another good one. And this is, now there's another thing you really have to think about though, because as Jenny mentioned a little bit before, there are a lot of people that have issues with colorblindness and you want to keep that in mind when you're designing something. And always make sure one big rule, make sure there's adequate contrast you don't put like red text on a red background like was done in that one slide. Um, if, if you have an image over a background, you can put a bar, like a white bar with black text to make sure that there's good contrast. Um, black and white or white on black is always safe. Some really not good color combos include like red and green, green and brown, green and gray, light green and yellow, things like that. Uh, you can always check this online though, because sometimes it's hard to see when you're looking at it. There's a couple of places that are really good for checking um, color contrast, like contrastchecker.com. Anytime when I make a graphic and I'm about to send it out, I put the colors into that website and make sure that everything's accessible. There's also another website here, davidmathlogic.com slash colorblind. And that's where you can really just kind of see what colors would look like to somebody that does have colorblindness. So a few basic design rules. This is kind of the stuff that like gets drilled into you in design school and it, it just never leaves. And this is like, once you get good at these, it'll just kind of be in your unconscious. And it's like some, so there's like a few things. There's this one thing called hierarchy, which some of you may have heard before. It's just, you have to keep in mind that at least like like here in America, we're like reading from left to right and moving down the page. So usually um, something that has a good hierarchy, like your most important elements will be somewhere in that top left area. And you kind of work down the page as you're going. And another element of hierarchy is has to do with size. So like your most important elements will usually be the biggest and the boldest. So for example, the title here is really big and bold and on that left side. Um, there's also another thing you have to keep in mind is this concept called white space. And that doesn't just mean that it's literally white space. It's just any space where there isn't text or an image. So this here, there's like some space around the text and there's just some room for your eye to breathe. And you really need that with any design because something too cluttered, people just aren't going to want to look at it. Um, another thing to think about is repeating design elements throughout the image. So for example, this typeface here that I'm using um, in white, that's kind of repeated throughout. It's If all of these were different, it would be a little confusing looking, but you just want to make sure that it's thematic and that you can really um, differentiate between everything, but that there is a lot, at least like a fair amount of repetition in your design. So we have now this really not good looking flyer here. <laughs> it doesn't have good hierarchy. Everything's just kind of plopped in there. Um, there. It's not really designed. It's just kind of text in a rectangle. So I'm hoping that you all could actually help me fix this a little bit. Um, so I have it here open in GIMP. And based on some of the stuff that we just talked about, we can kind of um, try and make it look a little better together, hopefully. So does anybody have any ideas of something that we could fix here? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. the title, uh, the title could be much bigger. Yeah, for sure. So one thing I do also, this is a good tip, like all of this, all this text is in one little text block. 
So one thing like I remember I was constantly told in in design school is like, oops, I said something weird, um, is to try and have everything in a separate text block so that you can move it around. So what I'm going to do is take that title out and make its own text block. And then I can mess with it here, make it bigger. And it, it automatically was red for some reason. That's just the, the dangers of working with GIMP. But <laughs> so that's, see that's, that already helps though. You can tell that's the title and that's really good. So any other suggestions? Something in the chat. No script font. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so let's get let's get rid of this. I'm highlighting it here, and I'm going to my font panel. And to do, do what is that? That's a funky font too. I've got a lot of funky fonts. Okay, let's get something more normal. And that's a little big, so I'm going to make that smaller. But now that's like a that's like a more legible font. Um, any other ideas for what could be helpful? Oh, I'll just get rid of the script here too. Even though I guess you can use it for like a title if it is something big, but it still sometimes can be a little hard to read. Ideas? Oh, there's something in the chat. What's it say? Change the background color, it says. Yeah. Yeah, I think this background's kind of not great with the black text. So I'm going to choose something. I'm going here to this little color selection area. I'm going to choose something that's a little bit lighter um, so that, well, that's maybe even a little too bright, but <laughs> so that basically the black text maybe stands out a little bit better at least. I don't know, I like pink. Um, and that's already a little better. I think what I'd do is I'd actually like delete some of this text. Like I think that's just too much text. So I'm going to like just make it one sentence. And somehow I have that in a different font. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, there we go. Um, I think, see, that's a little better. Another thing I do too is like, I'll hit enter here so that this is just kind of spaced out a little bit. And you can see that's already a little better. You can tell like, this is like the, the, um, the description part, there's the date, and it's not just one big text block. Anything else? I mean, I feel like we're, we could make it prettier, but I think this is like, this is okay. Like I could drop an image in there or something. But so you this might like, want to do something for hierarchy. Like you might want to fold the dates and time. So that's a little more immediately visible. Yeah. Let's make this bold. P22 bold or semi bold, I guess. Yeah, that's nice. And, and these could also, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say, then again, for hierarchy, you probably wanna think about is the date and time as important as that it was co-sponsored with Tompkins County Public Library, or is that something mm -hmm. the Tompkins County Public Library might become a little bit more of a footnote and smaller and your date yeah. might be bigger because that's kind of not the main information that you wanna convey on the flyer. Yeah, I think so. So I could move this down and make it smaller. And there's something in the chat. Some kind of graphic to catch the eye. That's a very good idea. Yeah, if you had a really compelling image to put here, um, that yeah. would definitely help catch people's uh, attention when they walk by it. And I can, I, I don't think I, have anything amazing to drag over there right now. Like I could drag this um, this cat over <laughs> and, and kind of cut the background out so you can see like 
So it's like maybe smaller and in the corner or something like that. But yeah, so it's good to like, yeah, drag an image in, make sure it's not behind the text. You don't want that because that can make the text hard to read. But some kind of image will make it a little more interesting looking. For sure. I think this is already a lot better though. So I think we're doing okay. Yeah. Um, I don't want to spend too much more time on this. So we'll move on from that. But that was really good. <laughs> Okay, share. Sorry, I accidentally closed the PowerPoint, Jenny. Let's see. Okay, can you all see this now? Okay, so we're going back to here. Um, and now I think actually, Jenny, you're going to talk a little bit more about images and file types. Yeah, so this is gonna be a very brief overview. Don't worry, it'll be very boring slides for just a few slides and kind of boring information. But I think it's good to just have a basic sense about images and resolution and um, the kinds of files that you're gonna be using when you build your virtual flyers. So can you go to the next slide, David, please? So the basic thing is that when you're working with uh, raster images, which we'll talk more about in just a second, you're talking about dots per inch or pixels per inch. And uh, this varies a lot, but what you basically think about is a one inch by one inch square, how many dots of color would you have in there to make the image? So if you're printing a photograph, for example, you don't wanna need less than 250 dots per that inch, or you're gonna end up with a, a photograph that looks really pixelated and does not look like it's good quality. Um, and for print, 250 or 300, uh, even better, is kind of your standard. But when we're looking at screens, we actually don't want to have that many dots per inch because it uses up a lot of space and makes a large file. So 72 DPI or dots per inch is ideal for uh, your virtual flyer. And that's going to keep your file size nice and small so that it can be shared easily um, along with a lot of other slides on our software, form, um, software that we all have on campus. Next slide. Um, and then you guys can talk. Sorry? Somebody needs to mute, I think, unless. I, okay. Um, and so on campus now, we used to have a lot of different size screens. Um, I don't know if anyone noticed with the, uh, the screen that had the um, food and fiber fair. Um, that was a slide that I made back when Man Library used to have a very little squatty square format for our images. But pretty much all screens on campus right now are using the 16 to 9 format. That's a 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. But they're either in landscape or in portrait format. So um, oftentimes, if you're making um, slides that you want to post across campus, you're going to have to create them in these two landscape and portrait formats, if not also in some other uh, shapes, uh, depending on the screens that they're going to be displayed on. It's not okay to sort of stretch and squish. You have to actually make your flyers fit the screens that they're intended for. Um, and then very briefly, just the basic difference between raster images and vector images. Most of the time you're gonna be working with raster images, your, your JPEGs. The easy way to think about a raster image is the photograph with its pixels. If you try to stretch that out, you're gonna lose quality. It's gonna become blurry and pixelated and unclear and you, you just can't stretch it, it has a limit, right? Um, with vector images, it's not pixels, it's a proportional formula. So you actually can expand them infinitely and they'll retain their, um, their quality. And so people use those for logos and graphic arts, um, but you end up with files that are much larger in size and these are not compatible with most of the image um, software that's used for screens. So we're really going to be sticking with raster images with the very important uh, <laughs> point that raster images just don't maintain their quality. You cannot be stretching them. You can't make them small and then big again. They'll lose their quality. They won't look good. Um, and so very quickly, your basic um, common file types, your JPEG, your ping or PNG, um, your TIFF and your PDF. And I just wanted to talk about each of them very, very briefly. Next slide. Sorry. So the PNG um, is really great for um, web use. 
Um, it's a small file um, and it can have the, um, unlike a JPEG, you can save it with a transparent background. So that's really powerful and nice for, for web use, um, but it is not usually an accepted format for displaying um, on screens, on LCD screens. Next. The TIFF is a very nice uh, file type that you would want to use for storing like your photographs. If you want to keep them for years and years, it's not lossy, it's not going to lose its quality, but it's a very large file. And it absolutely won't be accepted if you're trying to send a, a TIFF for posting on an LCD screen on campus, it's going to get sent back to you. Um, it's too large. It's just not going to work. Next. Um, PDF is uh, a whole different thing. It's a, a vector file format and it's great for your documents, but it also is not going to be accepted by the software for posting. So don't send a PDF um, of your, your document out. It's just, it's not going to be able to be posted on an LCD. And while PowerPoint, which we're going to go through in, in a tutorial, is really great for creating your virtual flyers, sharing in PowerPoint uh, as the PowerPoint file can't be posted to um, <laughs> the virtual software either. Um, so you need to be exporting out of PowerPoint to the JPEG format for posting. You can't send a PowerPoint file. So that brings us to JPEG, which is the file format that we're going to want to be using. Um, it's the best and usually the only format accepted for digital signage software on campus. Um, and it's a small file. It's very easily manageable. Now, these are not, this isn't how you want to store your precious photographs for years and years. They're not the great <laughs> uh, storage format, but they are perfect for this kind of, uh, you know, for the next two weeks, we're going to post um, about this event that's coming up. So use JPEG. Okay, so now you know a little bit about image file types. I'm going to talk a little bit about where you can actually find images and fair use so you can make sure that you're not using something you shouldn't be using that you could get in trouble for. So some really good places to find images. Pixabay is great. Um, most everything on, well, everything on there is uh, fair use. You can use it for whatever project you want to use. Wikimedia is really great as well. Those are probably the two I use the most. We also, which um, Jenny sent this link in the chat earlier, I believe. Um, if not, we'll uh, be sending it in a moment. We have the Man Image Repository, which is a collection of images from the special collections of Man Library. And there's some, they're not exactly um, fair use, but they are out of copyright because they're older images, so you can use them. And they're also just, there's some really nice stuff in there, so I check that out. You can use it for whatever projects you want. Um, for fonts, one I use a lot is Google Fonts. You can um, download some really nice professional stuff from there that you can use. Um, another one is defont.com, which, you know, that's mostly like it'll be user uploaded fonts fonts that were designed by maybe people that aren't always professionals. So there can be some funky stuff on there. So you just have to be a little more picky when you're looking through. But usually you can tell like when something's popular and has been downloaded a lot, there's usually some really good fonts that if you find those, those are usually good to use. Um, and then if you find an image somewhere else, you want to make sure that it's fair use. And I'm not going to go way too much into the details of what constitutes fair use, but Basically, you should know that just because you're making something um, in a university or or in an educational environment that it might not necessarily be fair use. But Cornell has some really good um, literature on this. You can go to this link here, which um, is going to be sent in the chat as well. And there's also a checklist that you can go through anytime you find an image and you want to make sure like Will I get in trouble for using this? Is this okay? Is it fair use? You can go through this checklist that is from Cornell and it'll tell you like um, basically if it is or not. And now we are going to, in a moment, <laughs> if um, Jenny is ready, going, we're going to go over a little producing flyers in PowerPoint. So I'm going to share my screen here. All right, is everybody able to see the, the PowerPoint tutorial here? I can't see if I'm sharing it correctly because of the way my screens are set up. But um, 
Holler. Okay, great. <laughs> Thumbs up. Nice. Uh, so in this tutorial, we're going to learn how to import uh, both raster and vector images, actually. Uh, manipulate those images so that they look the way we want. Um, add a, or an order to the images, the way that they appear, what's on the bottom and what's on the top. Manipulate your text and then export to the correct file size and format. So really quickly, I wanted to just show if you are in PowerPoint and you don't want to use this standard 1920 by 1080 um, that we use for most uh, all those screens on campus nowadays, but you wanted to create a poster, say, um, then you'd be wanting to think about your DPIs for print if it was going to be for print, but otherwise you can still do that in PowerPoint. You would go to design and slide size here and do your page setup. Um, and then you can choose for whatever width and height you want that to be. So that's the way to uh, be able to create posters in PowerPoint as well, um, or any other format that you want. Um, but in this one, we're gonna stick with the standard um, 1920 by 1080. And we're going to create this beautiful slide <laughs> to advertise science um, <laughs> on February 22nd, Science Day. Um, so the first thing you want to do is if those of you who have downloaded the, um, the assets from that folder that we put the link at the beginning of the talk, or you can just follow along, we're going to make this available as well in that folder afterwards. So you can follow along on your own time, or you can do it now if you want to do that. Um, but you go to insert and you go to pictures and then you picture from file. So in this case, I had a file with all these pictures and I, uh, import this one. This is one of the the ones from Man's collection that are copyrights. They're out of copyright, so we get to use this. Um, now, if I wanted to just make this image that we were looking at before, I'm going to have the basic image, and I'm going to have this smaller inset version that's kind of looking like I'm looking through a magnifying glass. So to create first that magnified image, um, I clicked on the image. Um, and then I go to picture format here, um, and that gives me all my editing tools for the picture format, and I cropped it. So I cropped it down from this size to this size and resized it by dragging on the right corners until I got it to the desired size. So it's that simple, just up and down. Then um, what I wanted to get is that circle so that it can sit inside my magnifying glass. So I take, I click on the image again, I go to the picture format, the crop, and on the drop down, I can do a crop to shape. And in this case, I chose the circle and I cropped it to this circle shape. Neat. Now I wanna have my magnifying glass. So I started off by going to handy dandy Pixabay, which we <laughs> advertised earlier in this. Um, Pixabay is really wonderful because they have so many images and it's all completely free and open use. Um, people who share this are very generous and allow anybody to use it without attribution. Um, and some of the, you can search on Pixabay if you want a vector graphic. So you remember this vector graphic is not a raster, it is in fact a vector. And um, when I go to download it, um, I choose instead of uh, an image, which like a PNG, which would be a raster format, I choose the vector graphic format, which means I'm gonna be able to manipulate it. I can make it very large if I wanted to. And I've downloaded that vector graphic and then I import it um, just like I would any other image into um, my, PowerPoint. So now I want to resize it to fit inside my uh, magnifying glass. So then again, I just click on the image um, and resize using the, the toggle on the right. Um, you can hold shift if you're worried about somehow pulling it out. But if you're in the, um, the corners, it doesn't actually change. Um, uh, it doesn't stretch it or, or distort it. Um, now I want to insert another picture, um, the background of this is another Pixabay download. I downloaded it at 1920 by 1280 so that it would be the right um, size and resolution for what I'm doing. It's in the JPEG format. 
downloaded that and then I insert it picture from file just like we did before insert pictures picture from file. Now I need another copy of this one so I, I just went ahead and imported it again, of course, you could just copy and paste and undo all the cropping but it's harder to to work backwards easier to just reimport it. And here I have all the basic parts of my image but it doesn't look right. They're kind of, this is piled on top of this, which should be in front. Um, so then I wanna click on the image and right click and send to back or front. So if this needs to go to the back, I right click and I send to back. Now, for some reason I have several of them on here. There it goes. So it's in the back now. Um, they do have, um, reorder objects. Um, you can see that sort of fancy reordering um, that can be a little confusing if you have a lot of um, objects, um, but otherwise you can reorder them like this. If I wanted the magnifying glass to be behind this one, for example, um, I can change it in that format. Um, so now my objects are all ordered correctly. Oops. ordered correctly. Um, and now I, if I wanted to example to change the sharpness of this image, if I wanted it to look um, a little bit sharper than the rest of the image behind it because it's being seen through the magnifying glass, um, I could do that uh, just by going to change the image sharpness, contrast and saturation, which shows up under format picture and has all of these options. Um, you can play around with that and see what looks good for your image. So now I have all these components together. Um, and if I wanted to then move my um, magnifying glass around uh, to find the best place on top of this image where it looks the most like it's magnifying it, um, I start moving it around and I lose my um, my other image because they're not grouped together. So I move the magnifying glass, I move these things, they're, they're separate. But if I wanted to group them together so that they would move together as I move them around, then I just go on, I click on the image and group and group to link two images together. That simple, so it's a right click. Um, all right, so now I have this and it's grouped. So when I move it around to place it, I can place it as one unit. Now it's time to add my text. So I um, added in just science, um, but I think hmm, maybe it would be fun to have a different font than this very standard one. So you can highlight the text and go to home and font collections and you get the drop down menu of all the fonts and that's gonna vary a little bit by what you have on your system. Um, in this case, I chose the Al Nile one. Um, and then I thought, yeah, but do I want it straight up and down? No, I'd like to tilt it a little bit. So this little wheel at the at the top is how you can tilt your text boxes and your image boxes, any, any box in uh, PowerPoint. So now I have text that is a little jaunty and a little fun that says science. Um, and I wanna put in my, my message, come see for yourself February 22nd at four o'clock. Um, and I wanna create a little bit of hierarchy there where February 22nd at four o'clock stands out. So it's bold, it's a little bit bigger. And I do that again, just by highlighting the, the, highlight the text, home, font collections, and then bold. So all of that's up here in the, the home. Um, so now I want to send you somewhere and I've learned that bit.ly um, science for you might be a short enough thing for someone to remember, even if they're only seeing this slide for for eight seconds. Um, but when I put it on there, I feel like there's not a lot of hierarchy. It's not standing out as much as I would like. So again, highlight the text, home, font collections, theme colors. This allows me to choose uh, any color I want for this. I'm going to go with red so that it stands out. Um, and then it's, it's looking better red, but I want it to stand out even more. So if I go to the highlight the text and shape format um, and shadow, I can do an outer shadow, for example, and any of all these other options to make the text stand out a little bit more. 
So there I am. I have uh, highlighted my text. I'm liking that. And then I think, oh, hi, uh, shadows. That works well for this text. Maybe there should also be a little bit of a shadow underneath this magnifying glass to make it look a little bit more 3D, like it's actually above that image. I can do that too. Highlight, um, picture format, shadow, and outer. And then I get a drop shadow on my magnifying glass. And I can move that around and have it come from different angles as well in that same place. Um, so now I have, I have this, I think it looks good. It's got my message nice and clear. You can um, remember and find what that link is. So I just wanna export it. I go to file, export, save current slide only. Now in this case, I have you know 27 other slides. So I really only wanted to export the final version of it. Um, Current slide only 1920 by 1080. That's the format of the screen on campus that I'm going to be sending it to. And then I export. And then I'm done. I send that exported JPEG file to whoever manages the screen that I want it posted on, and it should be all good. Awesome. Thank you. So that was how to just a design a slide in PowerPoint, but maybe you want to do something, maybe you don't like PowerPoint or you wanna try something else out or you're more comfortable working with something like Photoshop. Um, you can use Photoshop as well or Illustrator, anything like that. But if you don't have those, they're kind of expensive. There's one option you can use called GIMP. And I'll share my screen to show you what that looks like. So GIMP stands for GNU image manipulation program and it's free software where it functions kind of like Photoshop. And if you, I feel like one or two of you might've been at the um, tutorial we had the I, last week for this program, but it, it's, it functions a lot like Photoshop. It's a little bit more complicated in some ways, but you can do some basic stuff. So I'm going to go through how to make a basic virtual flyer in here. So it's, kind of like um, Jenny was going through with PowerPoint. You'll want to go to File, you'll go to New, and this is where you are creating your file. Um, so again, the dimensions are 1920 by 1080 for a horizontal flyer or 1080 by 1920 for a vertical flyer. And you'll want to make sure your resolution when you click Advanced Options is at 72 DPI, or it's also called pixels per inch. And yeah, that's the resolution that's appropriate for all virtual flyers that Jenny was talking about earlier. Um, and once you have all this, you don't really need to pay attention to this other stuff on here. Um, you can hit OK. And now you have a new file set up. And there are some basic things I should go over for GIMP. Just I, I'm assuming, at least for um, the nature of this tutorial that you all maybe have a little bit of knowledge or that on your own you can um, look back at the workshop recording that um, I did last week that will be going up soon, which goes into detail about how to use GIMP. But otherwise, I'm just going to do um, a few basic things and not explain everything I'm doing, but at least um, for the most part, I will. So you have this little workspace here. You have your tool area over here. Um, you have your layers here. And basically, right now, I have um, I have these images that I got together, which are in the folder that Jenny sent earlier. It's the resources for this tutorial. So if you have that, have those downloaded, you can actually drag them onto your working area here. And what I did was I found some images off of Pixabay again, and I decided that I would want to use those. So what I'm doing is I am dragging them. Um, let's see if I can uh, change my screen so that you can see the folder I'm dragging them from actually. So I have this folder here and this has my images in it and I'm just taking it and I'm dragging it into GIMP. And they'll just, at whatever size they're at, they'll show up like that. So this is obviously not the size I want it to be, but it's in there right now. So I'll show you once you have those like on your actual workspace, how to work with them and resize them. So this is the move tool, which I have selected right now. That's how you move things around. You can also go to this tool below it to either rotate 
scale. Scale means, you know, make it smaller or larger. And you just click and drag to scale. And I'm scaling and I'm moving it and scaling again. And then I'm going to go to rotate and rotate it. And then go back to the move tool, move it around some. And the same with this, I want this to be a little smaller. So I'm going to click on it and go to scale, click, drag, make it a little smaller, and then go to my move tool, move it around. So I want this to be centered here. I'll show you like what I put together earlier, which is what I'm basically trying to recreate here. Um, so I'm trying to do this here. Um, this is like just something I've, I put together, a pretty basic thing that we're going to recreate. So I have my images there, obviously, and I want to get my text in and I want to like maybe change the color on this too. So how do you actually get text on here? So this is pretty easy of this little like A here, which is your text tool. You click on that and then you click and you drag and you create a text box. So the text box is, is there and you can start typing in it. And I'm going to type, learn to write. <laughs> real author. Um, so we have that and it's right now though, it's this kind of little, like this not very um, clear color and I don't really like the font. I wanted to make it look like it was kind of being written by the pencil. So I'm gonna choose a cool font that can do that. And I'm going to also change the color. I think I want it to stand out more. So what I do is I triple click to select and then you'll see this little floating thing here, which if you click on that, you can choose the color and you can either do these sliders or click around here, or you can enter what is called the color code here. But I'm going to choose a red color, hit OK. And then I'm going to choose a font. I don't remember what font it is, so I'm going over here to try and find out. OK, so triple click again, and then I go here. I'm going to type in the font I want. See, and it's not showing up. Very strange. Okay. Um. Huh. Okay. <laughs> this is a problem with GIMP sometimes. Okay, so you can also go over here to this little sidebar sometimes to change your fonts. But let's see. I'm going to choose. I can choose this one. This is like an okay script maybe, or just scroll through and here's the font that I wanted. Here we go. Okay, there it is. And then I want it to be bigger. So this is the size here in pixels and you can hit the little up arrow to make it bigger, down arrow to make it smaller. So that's a pretty good size, but you know, right now it's centered in the middle of the page. So if I select it all, I can justify it, which means that it either goes to the left, right, center, or it can fill the whole page. But I want it to be on the left like this, because that's usually like if you're writing, that's how you would be writing. So I have it justified there, making it a little bigger. Okay, so there's that text. And I have this this here, which I'm going to move. And because I want it to kind of look like it's writing. Um, and I want to insert my other text in here as well. So I'll go to my text box, make a new text box. I'm going to include the date that this is happening. Let's just say, what is it? The 16th, it's happening today. <laughs> um, and then you maybe want some, some type at the bottom. It's sponsored by Man Library. But again, this is um, probably not a good color because it doesn't have adequate color contrast. So I'm going to make it black so that it stands out really well against that white background. And I'm going to, because this is going to be a smaller font, I'm actually going to make that a different font. So it's a little more legible. 
I do use script fonts sometimes. <laughs> so I like I, I think you can. It just you know you don't want them to be small and you don't want it to like be something too. Sometimes some of them are like really really fancy looking and it just doesn't. It's it's really hard to read. So like this is okay. Like that's definitely big enough that it's okay to be using that script. But so for this, I have that basic info there now. And again, I've been um, triple clicking. If I want to change something, I'll triple click. So it's selected, go and change the font here, change the font size. And so now I have this, and this is fine. This is like, you know, pretty basic looking flyer, but I actually want it to make it look like the, this is like, a red pencil that is writing this text. So I zoomed in here using my shift plus, which is how you zoom, and then you um, click not minus to zoom out. And what I'm going to do is go to this select tool here. This is called a lasso. And what on my pencil layer, I'm clicking on this and I'm making a little I'm kind of clicking, hit clicking, and then moving, and then clicking somewhere else so that I can make a selection just of this tip part of the pencil. And I get to the end of my selection and it closes the selection area. And you'll see there's like this little moving line, which means the selection is closed. And then from there, I am going to, there's a few things you can do. You can adjust the color for this, or you can copy. You can go up to edit, copy, or the keyboard shortcut is control C. And then you can go to edit, paste, and it'll paste it there. And now you have just that little part that I had selected there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to choose like a red color here, like I clicked on this little little box here, which is my color selector. I'm choosing red, hitting OK. And then I'm going to this thing called our bucket fill, which will fill my area that I have selected here with a color. And now that that is filled, it looks a little funny. It's still standing out like it just it looks very flat. So what I'm going to do is go here and change the type of layer that it is. These are like, whenever you have a layer, you can just kind of mess around with these things in here and it'll do some something kind of like, it'll do different things like screen will make it, make it so you can kind of see what's underneath it. Overlay is kind of the same, but they all have kind of different effects. So I'm doing that so that you can kind of bring the screen layer so that you can kind of see um, the pencil that is underneath it. So it has that little highlight there. So now I've done that. I think this is basically okay. I, I'm just doing something simple just so you can all can see basically how, how this um, software works. But you know, if this was something, if I was actually making an LCD, I would probably add something else, make it a little more visually interesting. But I think this is all right for um, our purposes. So you have this now and it's it's a GIMP file. It's not something that you could upload to an LCD. So if you were to send this in, it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't upload onto the screen. So you want to actually take it and export it like Jenny just did with PowerPoint. So you go to control E to export, which is in the file menu. And you'll see all of this stuff here, which you really don't need to pay attention to anything else, but um, when you go to select file type, you want to find JPEG. And there's all this other stuff that is just, you could think about like maybe if you get more advanced, but you basically you just need to know that you want your image to be a JPEG. So you find JPEG, you click it and you hit export. And now it'll show you all these things as well, which you don't need to worry about this stuff. I would just make sure that show preview and image window is selected. And it'll show you the size that your image will be when you export it. So you want to make sure that it is probably like less than one MB or around that. So I usually like will just drag the little quality bar to like 
make no, it a little we're, smaller. We're able to see what you're sharing, Daisy. I, don't, oh, I am not at least. Are other people able to see it? No, I'm oh, not seeing it screen. either. Okay, let's just share my whole screen again then. Okay, let's see if this works. So file, you're going to file export. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, that's that's weird. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me know. So you see this here, like I haven't I haven't named my file yet either. So I'm going to name it virtual flyer and the dates. And you want to select file type. There's all these files here, which we are just looking for JPEG in here. So click on JPEG, go to export, and you'll see this other dialog box pop up, which is what I was talking about. You don't need to pay attention to any of these things, but you want to click on show preview in image window. And this shows the file size that will be exported. And if you slide this little quality bar, it'll change that file size. And you want it to be at one MB or I believe like a little bit under is good just to make sure that it's a good size to upload. So I'll either slide this little bar or use the carrots to change the quality. You don't want it to be too low quality because then it could get grainy, but you want to keep it at a good size. So I think I think it's fine at this because I had it set up at um 1920 by 1080 at 72 DPI. So that should usually be okay. Um, and then you're going to hit export and it will export your JPEG. So I believe I have it here now and you can see, click on it, open it. This is our JPEG and that could be sent in and uploaded right to an LCD. So that is, yeah, that's the basics of working with GIMP. Um, there are some other things that you can use to create flyers, like Canva is a website that has designed templates, but um, that was the, I think PowerPoint and GIMP are some really good options for these flyers. 